Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Holly Putnam. Dr. Putnam is a 2003 graduate of The Ohio State University. After graduation, she returned to her home state of New York, where she practiced small animal medicine in the Albany region. In 2008, Dr. Putnam relocated to Austin, Texas, where she worked in a high-volume, high-quality spay-neuter clinic providing spay-neuter wellness services to low-income neighborhoods and area shelters. It was during that time that Dr. Putnam was able to see firsthand the challenges that shelters face in providing care to homeless animals. This experience sparked a passion for shelter medicine, which Dr. Putnam has now dedicated her career to. Dr. Putnam is currently a faculty clinician for the Maddie's Shelter Medicine Program at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine, as well as the Director of Operations and Outreach for Shelter Outreach Services in Ithaca, New York. Dr. Putnam is delighted to have the opportunity to educate future veterinarians about shelter medicine, as well as act as a resource for shelters and staff. In addition to teaching, Dr. Putnam is a board member for the Association of Shelter Veterinarians. Dr. Putnam currently resides in Trumansburg, New York, with her husband, two daughters, two dogs, and three cats. During her free time, she enjoys spending time with her family, fostering kittens, and hiking in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Dr. Putnam, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to participate today. So how did you specifically get started uh, getting interested in community cats and involved in animal welfare? The beginning of my career, probably the first half, as you read in my bio, I did private practice. And during that time, I honestly had no idea the extent of pet overpopulation or the struggles that shelters go through or even what a community cat was. And my husband and I were looking for a life change. Change. We, we moved from upstate New York to Austin, Texas. And during that time, I said to myself, well, maybe I should try something other than private practice. And so I joined this high volume, high quality spay neuter clinic in Austin. And that particular clinic is a man's pet and it supports over 12 shelters throughout central Texas. Additionally, I worked once a week at a spay neuter clinic at, in Waco, which is the animal birth control clinic, and worked Working there is really what opened my eyes to what was happening in shelters and the community and feral cat populations and community cats. So that was an education in and of itself. And I thought, you know, it's such a great thing what these spay neuter clinics are doing. And I saw that there was a need for even more involvement, you know, more services offered and more involvement within shelters. And so that's really what got me interested in community cats. And then my husband and I and my family, we would have loved to stay in Texas, but the majority of our family is in upstate New York and it was very difficult to visit them as often as we wanted. So I saw the position open at the College of Veterinary Medicine and the Shelter Medicine Program at Cornell. And I thought this would be such a wonderful opportunity to educate our veterinary students. Well, they're very open-minded and very fresh and um, willing to take in all the information um, regarding shelter medicine and community cats. And so you described the situation in Texas. Can you be a little bit more specific about what it was like for community cats in Texas in 2008 or in that Austin area? I wish I had um, exact figures to give you, but every day, I worked four days a week in Austin doing high volume spay neuter. And every single day we had cats coming in as community cats. And those could be, you know, unsocialized feral cats, or they were social cats that were just within the community itself. So that essentially they were going to be trapped, neutered and returned. And so, so this was something that we saw on a regular basis. And I feel like in Texas, there's probably even greater need within the Austin area, the low income communities, you know, really not only were they low income communities, but there were also many, uh, we refer to them as veterinary deserts within certain parts of Austin where there just was not access to veterinary care, whether there wasn't a veterinarian 
in that region or the low income community members could not get to the veterinarian. So there absolutely was a need. And then I truly believe that the warmer weather and the longer daylight down there was even more conducive to the community cats reproducing. So it's a different type of community cat problem, I think, down south than up here in the northeast where we have such harsh winters. We definitely see less community cats than I did when I was in Texas. So jumping ahead to the work that you do for the shelter outreach services in Ithaca, New York, what is the, I guess we're going to jump ahead to 2016 here, but you know, how did the two areas compare with regards to community cats? Our shelter outreach services program, a big component of it, of it is spaying and neutering community cats. But again, it's much more seasonal here in upstate New York. So in the wintertime, people don't really feel that it's very humane to trap because they don't want animals to be exposed to the harsh uh, winter temperatures for prolonged periods of time if they couldn't get back to the traps. So mainly the majority of our work is probably starting in um, late March and maybe going through November with community cats. But we do offer spay, neuter, and vaccination services to these kitties, as well as, of course, it depends on how social the cat is. If it's a truly feral cat, it gets released to where it came from. If it's a social cat, just to back up a little bit, Shelter Outreach Services provides spay-neuter for animal shelters and animal rescue groups throughout the Finger Lakes region. And so those organizations are the ones that really kind of decide the pathway for those community cats, or they work with the people who are bringing in the community cats as opposed to our organization itself. But what I see is that if it's a social cat, the partner organization may say, or the, the person bringing it in may ask, could they relinquish the cat to the shelter. And sometimes the partner organization will say yes. And um, that probably is reflective of the time of year and how full the shelter is. And other times the people are just willing to take them back. They just want to make sure that they can't reproduce. And so in addition to, you know, vaccinations, we can treat for minor health conditions as well, you know, like ear mites, fleas, things like that, in hopes of making that animal's quality of life better. In your position with the Maddie's Shelter Medicine Program, can you just describe a bit about what you do for sharing with students, you know, issues regarding community cats? Absolutely. We talk to students at uh, kind of in two different types of platforms about community cats. The first one is through a didactic course where we offer this course in the springtime um, companion animal welfare. And we also offer shelter medicine one and shelter medicine two. So this is a course that can be taken depending on which course it is. Sometimes it's first and second year veterinary students students, and sometimes it's third and fourth year veterinary students. And they're very popular courses. They're often full right away. But uh, right. yeah, yeah, exactly. They are elective as well. We dedicate a lecture, a complete lecture to community cats for both the companion animal welfare course and the shelter medicine course. And just introducing the topic of what is a community cat? What is currently happening? What did happen with community cats years ago? And how has that changed? And, and, and ideally, what we're trying to do is not only inform them about community cats, but hopefully spark an interest for them to participate when they, after graduation, and a desire to help with community cats as well. As I actually remember when I was working in private practice, we did have community members who would want to bring in cats for spay neuter, or I even remember some trying to bring them in for euthanasia. This was when I first graduated. They did not want them on their property. And so I think it's helpful for students just to have some sort of knowledge and other options in case they come across that too. There, I'm sure people are, veterinarians are still going to come across people who don't want these cats on their property anymore and ask for euthanasia. But maybe if the veterinarians can step in and say, there's another out for this cat other than euthanasia, that's the goal of our course is to provide students with the, the background and the resources on how to handle community cats. And so again, that's our, t our course that we teach in like a lecture style course. And then the other way, 
we address community cats with students is through a clinical rotation. And our program provides all the veterinary care for a local shelter that's probably like five minutes from the veterinary school. And that shelter participates in TNR with community cats. And so the students get to see firsthand these cats coming in. They get to examine them if they're social. They actually do the spays and neuters. We teach them. We are scrubbed in one-on-one with our students so that we're right there to encourage them and step in if there's any problems. And then they get to see the follow-up as well when the cat's released back out. Or in some cases, um, the cats may be relinquished to the shelter for adoption. So are you seeing statistically in some general trends in and around your area, a decline in surrenders to the local shelters? Yes, we do see that. I feel like the shelters in our region are quite rural. And I think that there's more opportunity for education to inform these shelters that releasing cats back out into the community is an acceptable practice. I think there still is that tendency that if they're social, then they have to be relinquished to the shelter. And that's not always necessarily the best situation, in our opinion, for the shelter and for the cat, depending on where it was living before it came into the shelter. So I think there's opportunity for more education, but absolutely, I think the shelters around our region are seeing less numbers. Even the other thing we're excited about is that our kitten intake numbers are decreasing around the region as well. So we feel like our spay-neuter hopefully is having some sort of impact in addition to releasing cats back out into the community. Yeah, that's That's the first wave of sort of statistical acknowledgement that your program is working is the decrease of kittens in the shelters. So that's good that you're seeing those numbers go down. That's usually with the groups that I've mentored in the past It's when they sort of see that, that drop happening. I'm like, all right, that means you're on the right path. You know, keep at it. Keep doing it. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Ready to make a big difference for cats in your community? We've got an exciting opportunity that can jumpstart your efforts. The Community Cats Podcast has launched Community Cats Grants. When you qualify for this innovative program, you'll gain valuable knowledge about how to raise funds for your spay-neuter efforts. Plus, we'll match the funds you raise up to $1,000, doubling your ability to make a difference for cats. Fundraising doesn't have to be scary. We'll be with you every step of the way. Check it out. You can find all of the details on the Community Cats podcast website under our education menu. Let's join forces to make the world a better place for community cats. So as you're looking at, you know, your knowledge of the community cat situation looking across the country, how how have things changed over the last 10 years? And what do you think life will be like for a community cat over the next five to 10 years? I am excited about what is happening with community cats because, again, when I first got out into practice in 2003, people were were absolutely bringing community cats in to be euthanized strictly for euthanasia. And they were considered a nuisance. And, you know, there's a lot of media attention and the effect that they have on wildlife and public health. And so I think media was even skewed towards making community cats the enemy. But I feel like over the past 10 years, we are starting to see an improvement. And I think the educational effort throughout the community has been ramped up. And I think the communities now, even according to studies, I'm thinking of some that were done down in Florida, where community members really do not want to see these animals euthanized anymore. So I think as a general community, everyone is wanting to see these cats remain healthy. And so I'm thrilled to see that, you know, and and we can see that it is acceptable that they can be returned back out into their communities instead of being surrendered to the shelter or being euthanized. And so the future is, we talk about this in our, our shelter medicine program all the time. It's very interesting to think about what is coming for the future in uh, for community cats as well as animal sheltering. And I honestly am not sure because I feel like over the next 10 years, we should start to see a good dent in our community cat populations just to, through you know natural aging and loss of cats through uh, through nature. And so it'll be interesting to see, uh, do these cats receive even greater health care because maybe people are actually able to start looking at them more as individual cats instead of colonies of cats or populations of cats. And so I think that we might be headed in that direction to be able to provide them um, greater care than other than spay and neuter. 
I want to take a step back and uh, talk a bit about you know training these students. Many of them are going to be going into private practice, and there's been such a big deal made and a lot of money invested made in these you know the high quality, high volume spay neuter clinics. But I feel that right now is the time to figure out a way for private practice to play a role with community cats. Is that something that you think about at all? Yes. And we talk to our students about that a lot because, you know, I can say firsthand that I've seen pushback from private practitioners when I worked in Texas with their, the typical fears that you hear about that, you know, these spay neuter clinics are taking their business and they don't want to see them around. And before I joined Shelter Outreach Services, the director reported the same thing here in central New York. But I do feel that when talking with the students, they are very open to it. I think this is the time to get the ideas into their head. You know, I think people have a hard time accepting a new information once they've been out for years and years and they've been doing what they're doing. It's hard to change people's minds, but our veterinary students are there to be to be educated. So they're already have a, a open mind and, and want new concepts. And I think this is the time to get the information into them. And so as far as private practitioners go, those that are planning to do that path, we talk to them a lot about participating in TNR within their private practice and how they can maybe look for grants to help fund that, if that's something that they're interested in doing. Or the other option is sometimes we'll just put the idea in their head that maybe they might want to think about volunteering their time for to do spay neuter at a different facility outside of their private practice. And then for those who really don't want to have anything to do with that, our hope is that maybe they could at least point people in the right direction as far as resources available to them out in the community if it's not going to be within their private practice or through them themselves. Yeah, I think that one of the things that has been very beneficial in Massachusetts with the Sunday spay neuter clinics that um, I've been involved with with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society is that a lot of the newer veterinarians have volunteered their time to be able to get their surgery speed up and more comfortable. And and I think some of the practices have actually embraced it a little bit. But I also wonder, too, if there's some way that we could have some sort of standardized package for even veterinarians to do rounds at the smaller nonprofit that can't afford to have a veterinarian on staff but maybe to have a veterinarian come through for a couple hours every week or every other week, you know, to help out with rabies vaccinations, with exams, some of the easier diagnostic stuff. I find, you know, especially these, maybe some of these even foster home-based groups, they really could benefit from something like that. Absolutely. Yes. I love that idea. And right as I was leaving the Austin area, we were talking about doing something like that for at least one of the shelters that was nearby that did not employ veterinarians. And the, and the reason that that idea got thrown out there was because a colleague of mine had gone to that shelter for some reason and she saw the, a dog that had an open fracture that was kind of sitting there waiting for someone to take a look at it. And so we threw that idea out that maybe we could alternate, you know, who goes over to the shelters to take a look and see how we could be helpful. I think the challenge is, of course, just like everybody else, veterinarians are so busy and it, right. it's difficult for them. But I think think it's also so rewarding and it's so needed, you know, so I think if that would be such a great thing if veterinarians could make that a priority in their career. And so that's a great idea. I should throw that out to students as well. Yeah. And another thought is to do like a vet co-op job or something where you had a group of 10 or 15 or whatever, however many it took to group together apply for a grant application to fund a veterinary position, but that veterinarian would be like the traveling doctor that would go from shelter to shelter. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. Yes, it's absolutely needed. I completely agree with that. That's a wonderful idea. Just trying to think out of the box because so many of our smaller groups really could use the assistance because some of them are new groups and they're really at the beginning of a learning curve too. And there's a lot of online resources, but there's nothing like having sort of that personal connection, I would say, too. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so true because animal sheltering can be very overwhelming, and especially for people who are maybe not coming from that type of background, you know, if you're just starting to get into this. So to have some sort of resource and a, a veterinarian available to you, if you feel like you're not alone trying to take care of all these animals and ensure that they are in good welfare while they're waiting to get adopted. 
So, Dr. Putnam, if folks are interested in finding out more about your work, how could they find you? Um, you are more than welcome to email me at hjp52 at cornell.edu. And that is my email that I look at multiple times throughout the day. And otherwise, you can call our shelter medicine program. And I should have that number available. And I don't have it on hand. So probably email is probably the best way to go. That's fine. And if you email me the number, I'll put it in our show notes. Excellent. I'll do that. And is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Oh, no, I'm just so grateful that I've been able to participate today. And thank you for the invitation for this. And I hope that people enjoyed the talk and keep doing what you're doing out there because there are so many cats that need our help. And I think that every little bit makes a difference. So thank you. If anyone out there is thinking about becoming a community cat veterinarian, I'd highly recommend you reach out to Dr. Putnam and and find out how you can become such a person. Thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on my show, and I hope we'll have you on in the future. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 